So uh, from my um, uh, closest to me, Alioun Badian, who's uh, a director in the uh, United Nations Human Settlements Program, living in Nairobi from Senegal in the first place. Thank you. Uh, Joe Beal uh, from the British Council, but with experience across Africa, Asia, uh, and Latin America. Uh, Gustav Landau from the city of Stockholm, but also works with the Smarter Cities, uh, the Smart Cities project involving Cologne and Barcelona and other European cities. Uh, Philip Roder from London School of Economics, uh, and Andrew Salkin, who's the chief operating officer of 100 resilient uh, cities. And I'd like to start by asking a question for uh, all of you, starting perhaps with um, Philip with a, a, an overview about the. Uh, we're, we're looking at the governance of urban transformation, and Obajit's provocatively put the, I would say, the pessimistic view about how governance is going to go. But are there, let's turn that round and ask, are there strategies, Philip, to start with you, um, what are the best strategies for governing transformation? Thank you uh, for sort of opening that um, panel with a complicated question. And I think I need to step back for a moment to then answer it appropriately. We've just heard how complicated uh, and complex urbanization is and urban change. And if we then move into the space of proactively intervening, one can just imagine that that even becomes uh, more of a challenge. Um, this idea of urban governance, I think, needs to be unpacked. Uh, it's very hard to actually point out actors globally that are not involved in urban governance. First of all, we have all sorts of institutions of the state at different levels, supranational, national, state, uh, the city level, very important, I'll come back to that, and then all sorts of local governance. But then there is the business sector, uh, the third sector, civil society, uh, and all of those need to come together to produce, co-produce uh, forms of urban governance. Now, stepping back to the optimistic perspective, and this is probably also one of the reasons why we uh, over the last years have increasingly been talking about cities because it's somehow a proxy for city government with T. And a lot of hope has been put into that, those institutions that govern what is the functional urban region, or in most cases, the, the political city not really mapping the functional urban region. And there are a few advantages of uh, governing space, territory at that level. First of all, it doesn't just represent a territory that is a sort of a pure coincidence related to history. It's a very real boundary. It's a boundary which we all actively create through our commuting systems, uh, where there are very real economies that connect with each other. And that, in turn, actually allows you to explore synergies between different sectoral interventions, probably in a far more sophisticated way than if you deal with major challenges at, at other tiers of government. And we're seeing that, uh, let's call it a core competence of city governments, of joining up, of integrating, particularly in the context of creating space. The place-making function is something I guess uh, a lot of us in the room will agree is not only a core area of urban intervention, it is also a core competence of uh, city governments. And Sorry, one, what does, does place-making mean? Uh, so the architecture, the planning, the infrastructure, okay. the physical intervening in, in our sort of urban futures. Uh, and those decisions are incredibly long-term. They will determine how our cities will look like, will be run like in 50, 100 years. So that's another very good reason to take advantage of that particular uh, competence. So I would stop here, but... Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the, the planning. Andrew, uh, on the effective strategies, perhaps ones that you've seen in action in some of these resilient cities. Sure. So uh, at 100 Resilient Cities, we're uh, partnering um, with cities around the globe. Right now we're working with 67, and our primary intervention is at the city level. And I think, as we were just discussing, we think cities are an important level of government that an entity that's able to make change. And what we're doing is we're helping the cities organize themselves and gain clarity about their challenges and risks. Um, and one of the ways we're doing that is by giving them funding to appoint the chief resilience officer. And the idea here is it, maybe it's not an individual who can help transform cities, but the idea of helping cities embrace their challenges and then working with the larger city, um, I think, as, we were, as you were just stating, the civil society, the citizens, the neighborhoods, but also the private sector and businesses to help kind of come together under one point of view 
is really critical because um, as the opening speaker talked about it, the complexity of cities is, is such a critical inhibitor um, to actually achieving change that it's going to take this ability to organize it all together and pull the, everyone um, in a similar way. And we hope that focusing on the challenges that they have uh, will help do that. Brian, um, Gustav, effective strategies that you've seen seen in action for governing. I mean, what, what, what's, what's the silver bullet here? Mm. Well, I have three silver bullets, if possible. And uh, I'm happy to be the representative of the city here at the panel as well. Um, uh, for the city of Stockholm and also working with other projects. And I think we have the same challenges very much in different cities around the world. We have to provide the housing for our populations and for the changing populations with more elderly, the, the different demands. We have the infrastructure that we have to work with and, and renew both for waste handling, for energy, these issues that we heard in the previous speech as well, but also the transport related issues where our cities are getting clogged with vehicles. We have these common challenges, both in our cities, in, in the Western world, and, and in, in, in the rest of the world. So I'd say there are three issues which are important for the governance. One, give us the, the correct national framework. We need a national framework giving us the power to do, uh, to do a good job. Second of all, when we work in the cities, we should try starting with pilot projects. It's difficult for a city to take a decision to change everything. Start with a pilot project and evaluate that well. And then when you do that, make sure that you have all three sides of sustainability on board. Both the, the uh, social, of course, because improving the quality of life is the main issue, but also the economic, that it makes sense from a financial point of view, and the ecologic, that is saving energy, reducing the CO2 emissions. If we look at examples of the national framework, in Sweden we have a CO2 tax, a tax on carbon, so that renewable fuels, which are biofuels, are exempt of that tax. Now that framework has helped very much the municipalities move in their energy supply towards renewables. So that kind of a framework is important, but of course, like in India, giving the local level of government a framework that works. Start with pilot projects. When we introduced congestion taxation in Stockholm, we tried it first for half a year. And afterwards, we had the, the referendum. Then people were positive to it. Before, they said never. But after they tried it, they were positive. Try it. And, second of all, and third of all, the, the three sides of, of, sustain, of uh, sustainability in all our trials, and also like in the Growth Smarter Project, which you mentioned, this is very important if it is to happen. Great. Uh, Joe, what effective strategies have you seen in, uh, in action? I think, I think for me the most um, important issue that we have to grapple with in cities is informality. Um, and, you know, our plenary speaker gave a very vivid picture of Delhi where the state provides nothing, people provide for themselves. I've recently been in Lagos, and before I went there, I did quite a lot of reading on Lagos, and there's Matt Gandhi's book, which is uh, in the category of urban noir. Everything is bleak and terrible, and informality has overtaken the city. We're never going to solve those problems. Um, Abdul Malik Simone, writing also about uh, Lagos, talks about people as infrastructure, and that we, if we use and build on people's energy, ingenuity, uh, resilience, that we can take things forward. And I spoke to someone from the private sector while in Lagos, and I said, well, you know, which of those pictures uh, are right for you? And he said, I just see opportunity. And I think, mm. you know, working in a system of governance that's not only about government, that's not only about social movements, that see citizens in all sorts of guises, that see the private sector as... Um, representative of people who are wanting to embrace opportunity, I think that's where you have uh, a really good starting point. And if I can just share one more anecdote. I was in Kinshasa a couple of years ago. Um, it is, uh, and you know, the Congo has been mentioned. Uh, Kinshasa is a city where there's just no electricity unless there's a, a generator, where um, it is 
huge, sprawling, where every pavement has um, uh, f flowers, food growing. Um, and I went to the university there, up on a hill, remnant of, uh, you know, independence and... Um, the driveway going up to the university had photocopiers on either side, and students were queuing up and paying for photocopied uh, chapters out of books that had been written in the 1950s. And it was tragic, and there was queues to get into the lecture theater. Now, if we can deal with that enthusiasm, that thirst for knowledge, if we can uh, capture that in, in, in the way we develop cities, if we can get better universities and people working together, there's, there's a, a huge appetite for improvement. So we've just got to find ways of harnessing it. So informality is an opportunity. That's essentially absolutely. What you're saying. I think ultimately what we want is to see a process of formalisation, right. because informality is laissez-faire urbanisation, and that uh, is problematic. But uh, you can't force that. You have to work with it and work with the grain. Okay, uh, Andy. Yes. What What do you sense at, to be the kind of effective strategies? emerging for, for governing organizations, authorities, wherever they may be? Thank you, Andrew. I, I do not know if I have a straightforward response to that. This is a man of 25 years in urban preaching talking. I do believe that although the speakers say that there is no straight way to do it. I do believe that as well. I wish today, uh, at the end of this uh, very interesting gathering, we'll be able to come up with a kind of algorithm which will allow us to put up the y-axis and the x-axis into a transect that will give us the solution to deal with cities. Unfortunately, not possible yet. Maybe in our dream we can get right the way to govern our cities and to make them better to fulfill the promises. Whether you like it or not, since time in memoriam, cities have always been a dream for any nation, for any communities, because of what you have said early on in terms of improving life, in terms of giving hope. Uh, even we said about the city lights, to be a hope for people. Today, if you look at the map of Africa, is with regard to energy. It is so dark that you will question yourself when, if energy is the factor that will be measuring development, when Africa will be developed. I don't know, Chair, because for the last 20 years, UN Habitat, because this is where I come from, has been uh, propagating the ideas of cities as a powerful force for sustainable development. Even we said that it will be no sustainable development without sustainable urbanization. There are many aspects that can uh, confirm that paradigm. But wow, a hard way to go. Many of you certainly have heard what happened in Ghana three weeks ago. Unfortunately, uh, a stacking layer of misdoing that have ended up into killing 200 people. It's nothing. If you see the issues of safety and security that is happening all over the world, it's not only in Africa. Over here, in the neighboring of European Commission, you see the issues of migration coming in very, very strongly. I, is Europe going to seal their border to say that you guys, you stay in your poverty, we enjoy our wealth? Is it so? I don't think so. The world is global. And UN Habitat is advocating from poverty issues to development, there is a long way to go. I do take that it is possible if we have a compact of togetherness. I do believe that it is possible if we educate our people, because there is nothing about development without education. Our system, as you say, Joe, in the Congo, I know the Lovanyum University that you are mentioning, it is terrible how our educated system is compromised. Uh, I think Mr. Banerjee told us about something quite interesting, 
with regard to the city authority and national government is a big challenge because for UN Habitat, there will be never a sustainable development without mayors being involved. But wow, will mayors be ever be given the power to tax? Will they be ever met? Maybe in Sweden, you have a chance. But in the global south, as you said it, we have so many cases where the mayors are denied any sustainable solution to get their own resources and to, do, to make their own development. I will come later on with a, in the conclusion maybe with a 10 point of what we call 10 levers in our ten what? Small, 10 short points. Yeah, yeah. Right. Can I make it? Can uh, not, I make it? No, no, not now. Not now. Let's, not let's, now. Let's, let's later hold on. on. To the 10. Yeah, it will be the 10 point of what we call levers for sustainable development in what we are trying to compact and craft this new urban agenda. Okay. There well, is a the hope. There is a the hope if we get together in Habitat 3 next year to have a compact for the next 20 years for urban development. There is a the hope. Okay, well that's good, that's optimistic. All Thank of you, you have come up with optimistic views. Let me just drill down into this issue of placemaking that, that Philip started with. Because and Objit Banerjee said very clearly that the planning uh, is very hard to do. Over a period, if, as he said, you go back uh, not very far, nobody necessarily predicted uh, that the expansion of uh, urban um, urbanization in, in China or other countries. So where, does the, where is the line drawn for, pla for urban planners here? Because some order needs to be imposed on the informality. Some str strategies need to be laid out. I, I just wonder whether, um, Philip, you think that the, uh, there are limits to what planning can do and that they've been exposed. Or, or do you place great hope in the, in the plans that might be made on the basis of... Yeah, um, you know, false premises. I mean, first of all, of course, there are limits, and planners uh, in the last 50 years have learned the very hard lesson that you know they can't just uh, mold and form territories according to their beautiful uh, visions. Uh, where that happened, in fact, you know, some of the modernist planning, uh, even in this city, we're still suffering from. So there, there are very big problems with this idea of comprehensive planning. You know, planning everything from the top in the greatest detail. And we have gone, I think, full circle. There was a period, of course, maybe from the 1980s for 20, 30 years, and in many countries, I think we're still suffering from that, where uh, planning was entirely dismissed, spatial planning, as, uh, as something that's not particularly useful. Uh, and I think I attach probably quite a lot of hope to this term, which is often referred to as strategic planning, where you're a bit more systematic about what really matters at what scale and you focus and you prioritize those things, and you leave other areas more to sort of evolutionary forces, bottom up. So what matters at the metropolitan scale is, for example, your strategic transport infrastructure, your strategic sewage and freshwater infrastructure, uh, your uh, energy systems. Uh, it's very hard to argue that those um, you know, can pop up, develop informally, um, and I think the more we concentrate on those uh, with the formal processes, the more we also then at the same time allow that maybe the definition of where a balcony happens or where certain kind of shops take place is left to uh, more local uh, decision making. And in fact, in some cases, even the community or the informal, right. uh, as Joe mentioned. Gustav, would that work in, uh, in Stockholm? Certain amount of uh, informality about, the, uh, about where things get well, well, well I, I do recognize what you were saying because we have had a period now when the comprehensive planning has gone down a bit in Stockholm, but now Stockholm is one of the quickest urbanizing cities in Europe actually at, at this moment and we have a greater uh, challenge to meet all the different needs on, on, and uh, competing needs on the land use. And therefore, we once again have to increase the use of comprehensive planning. But we don't have to go into the details, but we have to solve the infrastructural issues, especially those of, of the planning of the, the transport infrastructure and, and the buildings. So yes, it is coming back, and it's important, but we don't have to determine all the details. Right. And uh, from New York, I mean, you, you, you have experience going back with the Taxi Commission. That's obviously a a sector that is, is being disrupted in, in a massive way and people are questioning whether the rules, the fairly rigid rules that applied there were... No, I think, I think you raise a great point. Um, the idea that you need to have good 
planning, and strategic planning I think is important, but I think thinking about planning without understanding the governance around it um, is, is something we should be cautious of. And I think one of the key roles of local government is also regulation and enforcement. And I know it gets down to the nitty gritty, but if the very first thing that you do when you purchase a piece of land is not understand what your development rights are or what exists there, but you go and you lobby your local alderman, councilman, or politician to help change the rights that you now have, that becomes a very ineffective way of, of governance. And one of the things that we've seen in many of the cities we partner with is the inability to enforce and have strong guidance and governance undermines actually the ability to govern and it becomes, becomes self-fulfilling. So even if you are being smart about your investments in major infrastructure, transportation, electricity, and water, um, it still doesn't necessarily lead to the outcomes that you're striving for. And that's something I think that becomes very hard and goes back to the complexity of, of actually governing. Can, can, a, can a city like New York be um, harness some of this informality that Joe's talking about uh, without sort of stifling it with regulation? I lived in New York and it always struck me as being far more rigidly regulated than I had expected for a city with that reputation? That's a good question. I think there is a lot of informality, but I think there's um, the idea that when you want people to, um, when people are being asked to engage and do things in new and unique ways, you need to allow that to happen, but I think it's helpful to have it happen in a way that is at least understood on how it impacts others. So to allow for new construction where it should happen, and that necessarily means closing streets and doing new business in different ways. Is that something that should be at least controlled and complemented and communicated to the public if you're going to engage in placemaking and making big changes? I think there needs to be a conversation in some kind of entity that is kind of the referee or, or at least the conductor of that orchestra. And I think government and city government can play a key role there. Right. Joe, um, I mean, too much placemaking is going to wreck this opportunity of informality, isn't it? People come in and say, oh, sorry, not that place, you'll have to go to this place. Well, I, I think um, if you go to the issue of working with the grain, I'll give you two examples. In London, um, buskers uh, operating in uh, the tube stations, singing, playing their instruments. Uh, there's been quite a big uh, backlash against that, but it was found that they were actually very useful in helping um, community policing and, and policing in those sorts of spaces. So I think you can work with the formal and the informal uh, if, if you get it right. I see Logi Naidu um, in the audience, the city of Durban, Etequini. Um, there was a study done there that the uh, informal traders around the main railway station um, were ha had a turnover that was higher than the biggest shopping mall in the city. And with that information, the city worked very creatively, preserving the informality, preserving people's livelihoods, preserving the people whose footfall was going through the station rather than the shopping mall. Um, and I think that was a really good example of working with informal traders, customers, the city, to improve things. There were, there were problems. Um, in Zulu culture, bovine heads are a delicacy, and it was a difficult issue for the city to manage many stores selling bovine heads without refrigeration. But it's dealing with those issues and working with the grain that you can really uh, do something quite creative. Right. I mean, I'll maybe bring Alun in, in here on the point about mayors being vital to this process. Obviously, not all mayors are competent. Some of them are power-seeking. Uh, not all of them have the ability to work in that rather informal, light touch way that Joe's yeah. suggesting. How, how do you ensure that you get the right people into those positions? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think it is, I again refer to uh, Prof. Banerjee's uh, lectures this morning saying that do we have the right people there? Can we have the right people there? And oftentimes when you end up having the right people there, they become a threat to national government right. then because they may see them as a contender to the next election. Yeah, we're sort of aware of that here in London. <laughs> I heard Joe, Joe <laughs> told me. It's happening everywhere. I think it is the nature of uh, power in human being. But the relationship between national government and then local authorities in terms of planning is absolutely necessary. 
is the necessity. And let me give you four pillars with regard to national, local government relationship with regard to planning. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, planning requires law, orderliness, and legal system. You see, you cannot make a city, although you may want some dose of informality, but in order to keep it sustainable in the long term, as far as your habitat is concerned, we are trying to advocate for 40% for of the cities to be open in order to cater for all different needs of the people that want to move, to have an open space where they can interact. And I'm happy that uh, the city of Stockholm is actually hosting, at the end of this month, a very important uh, local authorities meeting and on place making. It is important. We have to really to make the things right at the beginning. It is the first pillar. Planning requires law and legal systems to be sustainable. Second element is planning requires land. I don't think that I have seen any plan in the air yet. Maybe in the cloud you can plan, but it requires land. And it is one of the most difficult commodity to manage at the city level. And sometime in my lectures, I used to say that it is one of the most interesting commodity for politicians because of corruption. Land is a very interesting commodity to make sure. money and just to go vanish. 10 years after, when the issues will be erupting, you are long gone. You are not there. But require proper land planning. And our GLT and our Global Land Tool Network, for those of you that are here and then interested on that, we are doing a quite fine job on that one in terms of management administration. The third element is planning require people. You cannot plan without people. If you do that, it's a void. You're going to lose because people will come back and then to their right. And finally, effective planning requires capital. I'm sure we'll talk about that a lot today. But to come back to your issues, you cannot do that without local authorities because you can plan at the national level. There is a need for. And one of the most difficult things that we are dealing will come back later to that also is the metropolitan planning. How do you manage a city of 20 million? And more and more, unfortunately, not only the city core, but the metro is becoming a big issue to manage. There is no legal system to manage big metros. There is no effective integrated planning, as you were saying over there. And the distance, this is the reason why we are advocating for compact cities, more and more compact cities, so that move from work to uh, home dwelling places are integrated. Not that you walk 20, 40, 50 kilometers. The impact into CO2. The environmental issues, all of them require to revise the planning system at the city level. So it is a key element, but it is very difficult to articulate. Right. What, what do anyone on the panel think about uh, um, the idea of breaking down the currently huge cities like Delhi into smaller units of governance, as Obajit was suggesting? <laughs> is that feasible? Are there examples where that's happened or is, is happening? Well. We, we have 67 cities, and they vary from size. So we have Mexico cities and the Bangkoks and the New Yorks, Los Angeles and Londons. But we also have smaller cities like um, Biblos and Lebanon and Ramallah. Um, and then there's some smaller cities in the United States as well. And I think one of the things that's interesting is there, there might be, um, there seems to be something about if the government feels closer to the people that it's able to better harness all the different demands in a more effective way. Um, and I don't know if that's just uh, early observations or something that's going to be a true trend. But we definitely see a difference in a place like Norfolk, Virginia, which you know, has a couple hundred thousand people. The budget is you know, not huge for a US city. Um, and they seem to have a different feel about who they are in their place. And they can think about it holistically versus uh, a larger city um, Bangkok, which is, you know, has a lot of different competing needs simultaneously happening at, at rapid speed. But are any of them, any of those large cities, Bangkok or Mexico City, for example, breaking down their units into their units of governance? I think, I think you, what we're seeing is the opposite: is, is governments are right. coming together, uh, some under the name of efficiency, yes. uh, <coughs> and trying to create that. I think yes. it'll be interesting. Um, I was just talking with the city of Manila and Philippines, and 
you know, that's 11 metropolitan areas overseen by um, one large municipality. I think what will be interesting and what I was trying to understand is what exactly do the local mayors oversee versus what does the municipality oversee? And right. I think that might be right. an interesting piece of who should govern what and when should they govern it. Right. Gustav, you have Yeah, well, we introduced district councils and put very much of the power to the district councils to be closer to the, the, to the people. And that we did for some 20 years ago. Now some issues like infrastructure have moved more back to the, to the central part of the city government. But still the social issues, the child care, all of that is still at the district council. So I, I'd say, once again, try, do pilot projects, try introducing district councils in these large cities and see, give them the power for certain issues and try and see how it works and then uh, uh, continue the transformation. Right. Philip? Yeah, I would say it's, it's really a twofold story. Um, the, the first thing we should accept uh, for a city of the size of Delhi, in fact, even uh, the size of London, which is smaller, is that you probably do need two tiers of government at least, possibly even three. Um, the second thing to say is that uh, it's generally a big advantage if you have some kind of metropolitan-wide or city-wide uh, configuration that is sort of coherently governed. What you don't want to have in a metropolitan uh, region is too much of a splintering. In fact, even uh, Paris uh, is suffering with that. The, the mayor of Paris uh, is governing the equivalent of two million people, and, and that's generally seen, and outside of that, you have more than a thousand municipalities as a massive uh, sort of coordination problem. But I do agree uh, with Abhijit that, that probably within that, uh, borough level or district level organization for those issues which are not strategic for the metropolitan region, a, a sort of proximity to citizens is of enormous value. Right. Are, th are there any losers in this process, Joan? I mean, I think it's interesting, Jean-Paul Fagoe's work on Bolivia shows that decentralization really works in small and medium-sized cities. It doesn't work in big cities. Right. Um, so it seems I, like the contrary of what uh, Abhijit, was, Abhijit was suggesting. Right? Well, no, I think it, it supports down. Abhijit's argument because you do, you do need uh, sub-metropolitan ah, okay. levels of government um, in, in very large cities. So I think I would support that idea. Um, I do think we can uh, get drawn into the idea that the closer to the people, the more democratic the government is, and that's not necessarily the case. So, you know, a lot of people would argue that uh, in decentralized or local government, women have a better opportunity to engage in politics or to engage politicians and, and officials, and that is not necessarily the case. Uh, you also can get a tendency to more pork barrel politics the, the lower you go. So, yeah. so I think we, we, we should um, advocate for it but not think it's a silver bullet. Right, right. I mean, the, I, I want to open this out to the audience in a, in a second, but uh, just one of the overall points raised in the, in the, in the keynote address was this reconceptualization idea. Who's going to do this reconceptualizing? Is it the UN? Yeah, probably. It, it is part of the compact because uh, we are engaged with uh, the UCLG, United Cities and Local Government. I mean, they are trying at the global level to interact, to have lessons learned between themselves. Uh, just on the prior question, I think it is a kind of Noria, a back and forth. I mean, you know the attempt of Toronto to go back and forth. London over here, I've tried it, go back and forth. Dar es Salaam is amalgamating. Dakar is breaking. I mean, you, it is a back and forth, and often, maybe in confidence, is always depending on the government of the day mm. and how do they see the power of an authoritative, capable mayors at the central level commanding more, actually, more power than government. Then they break. They said, no, 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 this is not working. Right. It's too complicated. We're going to break it. But that's only going to get more difficult that's as going to cities be more get difficult bigger and more. As cities get better. That's the reason why the two or three tier system is absolutely a necessity. There are some issues that need to be commended at the cross level. So that schools, I mean, a bit of education, a bit of... But the key issues of metropolitan planning should be planned at the central level. Right and then it be the possibility. But the negotiation is something that had to happen. The UN is, of course, ready to play their role. We have to play with the National Association of Local Authorities. Sometimes there can be a very good system where they can help each other. They are not at the same level. 
you have metro that 10 million in between I mean you can have boroughs but they call, they should form a core of local authorities that can negotiate with government that can negotiate with international association so that they can be backed up by a global system okay. of management Jose, do you want to come back in now yeah I just I just wanted to add that I think national uh, cities are too important to leave to city governance and that what you have to have is city governance articulating with national <laughs> urban policy. And I think the problem in many um, of the fast growing cities around the world is that you have national governments that um, are very much focused on rural development, uh, rural led or uh, agricultural led industrialization, and they don't uh, think about cities as key to, to economic growth. So Africa is a continent that has urbanized without uh, industrialization. Right. And that's a one of the problems, I think. So you have to have a national urban policy articulating with what's happening right. at city level. I think Gustav wanted a right of reply on cities, not right. being the best governors I, of cities. I'm sort of feeling <laughs> quite alone here at this panel representing <laughs> the city level. Uh, the, it's a questioning if there's a competence of the mayors on the city level to do the work. There, and, and here are a lot of representatives for organizations which are way above the local level are trying to figure out how they could help the cities which don't seem to be able to solve their problem. But I think that the main driver will come from the people in the cities, the businesses in the cities. They see the need for a more uh, coherent way of working, creating the infrastructure. They see the needs in the cities. They, they will see that uh, by doing things in a more better planned way, they will actually be both saving money and increasing the, their, their, their life uh, uh, quality. So I think that the main driver will come from the cities and we do see a lot of mayors around the world which are doing a wonderful job in improving their cities. So I would say, why not look at the national level and try to give these cities some of, 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 of the power they need to drive this work. Right. Okay, let's open up for some questions. We haven't really touched on where uh, government uh, interlocks with the private sector. That's maybe something we can come to in the questions, maybe some questions on that. Uh, yes, a lady on the front table here. Microphones are coming to you. Can you say who you are and where you work? Hi, it's Mikhail Brack from the City Impact Challenge. Um, I work with entrepreneurs to develop uh, uh, innovation districts in cities that help solve a, a, an urban problem. And there's been a lot of discussion on the uh, panel about, well, and particularly from, um, from Joe, about, the, about informality providing opportunities. And that suggests entrepreneurship is positive and, and should be encouraged. I can see that is happening in the context of developing economies. And I wonder what the panel thinks about how urban policy can be used to um, encourage entrepreneurship and innovation and the use of SMEs, local SMEs, contributing to their own local economy. Okay, who would like to, to pick that up, Andrew? Sure, I think entrepreneurship is, is critical. I don't think it's just in creating new businesses, but it's taking advantage <clears throat> and being resourceful within your own community. And I think that um, it's extremely important that cities help foster that. One of the ways that cities can help foster that and something we're trying to help cities do is cities spend tons and tons of their own money and they do it in a way that effectively is, um, keeps the local entrepreneurs excluded because of the way they do procurement and the way they leverage their dollars. And we want to work with cities to help them understand that asking better questions and better ways can actually free up that local capacity and create that better relationship where everyone's actually working together to build a better city from within and for themselves. It's a really tough one. And, and again, I think it's, it's as part of the nitty gritty of governance that gets in the way. Um, Okay. Um, yes, question at the front here. Hi, Kate Cooper, uh, social finance hat today. Um, question about, a lot of you have been talking about the sort of power to the cities from a sort of national framework perspective, which I think is crucial um, and puts you actually all on the same page in terms of taking some of the breaks of cities. But how much of that discussion is happening or how much of, you, of your organizations are having discussions with sort of national treasuries and prime minister's offices and people who are not in the urban ministries or the ministries dealing with, with, with urban related issues? Because it seems to me that is 
an area where there could be a lot more dialogue with people who can make that national framework happen rather than silo it in some of the wrong or less powerful ministries for the right. time being. So is this just wishful thinking, Gustav? And well, Ali and yes, well, 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 I can give some examples, actually. Worked in several projects with other cities in Europe also, especially on, on uh, vehicles, on renewable fuels. And we've seen some of the obstacles and some of the national uh, taxation systems taxing the alternative fuels higher, actually, than conventional fuels. So we have both gone to the national governments and pointed this out, and in some ways they have actually changed the legislation, but we've also been speaking with the parliamentarians in, in, in the European Parliament to, to work with those issues. So, yes, examples like that do happen, and, and, and when you do work with pilot projects, you can identify what are the main barriers and then start working on trying to overcome them. Right. Aliun, some, yeah, some, some examples? Yeah, some example is that uh, you cannot certainly uh, invest or many cities without not only touching with the ministers uh, in charge of local government, the ministers in charge of planning, the ministers in charge of finance and treasures. I mean, we have here into, into the, the gathering uh, the Cities Alliance, which is our partner supporting us in this respect. And then any time that uh, we are engaging with those uh, countries in terms of country programming and everything, we are approaching. Actually, we are not alone. We are into our midst, something like 12 or 15 partners, including World Bank, including the others. And we are approaching. When you go into a country, it's not just discussing with mayors, but also we are talking with the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning, sometimes asking them to loosen a bit the regulation, or sometimes asking them to give more possibilities for mayors to have more authorities with the, the tax collection and the others. Of course, we have some setback in some countries where a good program is put on the table and then at the last minute being cut by the Minister of Finance because of exactly what we were saying earlier on, the power of cities. But certainly there is a need for engaging them at the highest level. And I know Jean-Pierre Elombasi in the Afri cities is always inviting the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Local Authorities together with mayors in the same room to dialogue and to see how they can in involve them into the decision making. Right. Um, more questions? Uh, yes. I want to raise the debate Sorry, about. Can you just uh, remind uh, people? Logi Naidu from the city of Durban. Yep. Thanks, Logi. Um, about metropolitan governments against uh, disaggregation and reducing the size of, of these municipal councils. Um, is it not our lived experience that when you have the critical mass, when you have much more powerful local governments, that you get more effective delivery of services and improvement in the lives of people, rather than reducing their powers, uh, scaling down their operations, which does not necessarily mean it's cost effective. Uh, for example, bringing of basic services like water, electricity, and sanitation to people. Surely it makes sense when you have a large metropolitan government, as long as it has the powers to, uh, including powers to raise finances, etc., cetera, um, to be very effective. Uh, in South Africa, we said local government is the hands and feet of government, and this is where delivery takes place, and why it should be an independent sphere of government, autonomous with its own original powers. So when I hear the debate about reducing size, I'm not sure in what context it's being raised. But you'd, you'd agree, presumably, that critical ma between critical mass and Delhi, with its, where each constituency is the size of, a, of another substantial city in a smaller country, that, that there might be a problem of, of too big in some cities. Would that, would that be right? Or do you still think that the economies of scale are, are, are big enough? Well, I think if there's effective management, if you really have the competent people in government, be it the political component and people in the administration, certainly it, it can work. Right. Well, let's put that. Is it effective man does effective management deal with this as well better than breaking down these large conurbations, Philip? So, I mean, let me use the case of the very city we are uh, sitting in at the moment. Uh, London, for 15 years, did not have a London-wide government. It was governed by central government on the one hand and then by 33 boroughs. 
and those that uh, will have been in London at the time will remember that it was a period that was difficult. It was difficult to put London on the map for national government. It was difficult to proceed with many of the strategic projects. And more importantly, since 2000, where we now have a uh, mayor of London, we have the Greater London Authority, and very importantly, we have something called Transport for London, which cuts across all modes of travel for the entire city. We have seen amazing improvements in the city. Yes, it's a chicken and egg thing, because the city, of course, also very much profited from a global economy during that phase, but I think most observers would suggest there are very direct uh, correlations with a change of government uh, that uh, benefited for the city. So a very clear example of greater centralization having led to better outcomes. Right. So you're agreeing essentially that that, yeah. you don't need to break down. Sorry, Ali, you wanted to yeah, it, in there briefly. It is just in relation to some critical aspects that are <coughs> more and more emerging to be absolutely difficult to manage at the micro level. Safety and security, take it. Do you think it can really be managed at the small level? I don't think so. More and more, our cities, because of the size of the population, because of the size of the threat, in terms of mobility, in terms of planning the essential lifeline services, will more and more require a kind of central capacity to be managed. The issue of resilience of cities. You shut the power, the water cut. You shut the water, the power cut, if you have a nuclear power systems. So there are some critical aspects at the city <coughs> level that more and more require to be managed right. at the central level. Right. And this is something that we need to insist. To start briefly? Well, I, I, I say we, we, need different, we need different levels of government because you didn't abolish the boroughs when you created the Greater London either. So you, you need the different levels for different parts. For infrastructure, it's probably often the city-wide level. And, and I, I, I think it's important to have uh, these levels uh, uh, through democracy so that the people can choose the politicians to, to manage the cities. It shouldn't be a national uh, governmental issue to run the cities. It should be run by the, the people, the businesses, the entrepreneurs, those who can pro uh, profit from the work and, and to take the decisions together. So you, have to, you need a city level, but in some cases also a, a, um, a smaller level for, for certain issues. Right. Jo, did you want to have a quick um, word? I, I just wanted to support that, uh, that concept of, subs of subsidiarity, I yes. suppose. Um, and, I, and I would absolutely agree that at neighborhood level or borough level, uh, there are some things that are more appropriate to manage there, and at, um, at, at city level, certainly infrastructure would be an obvious example, but there are many others. And to go back to the question on enterprise, um, you know, if there is a city support for entrepreneurial development, um, that, that is something that's important, but it can perhaps be developed in neighborhood planning or, or local planning. So I think that's critical. Um, and. I would go back to saying also nested in a, in a broader national policy um, as well. Right. Um, I think we're out of time for this, question, this session. Oh, unless there's one, one brief question here, maybe. Just the last one, as uh, brief as you can. Jeremy Anderstein for Farrells and the Urban Design Group. I'm not sure it's such a brief question, actually. Uh, can you keep my, it? My, que my question would be, uh, of course, it, it's, it's normal uh, to, to support success where it is and empower mayors which already showed good initiatives. But, and, but in a way, I, I'm wondering uh, how it's, it would be supporting uh, an imbalance. And I think London is a good example of that. There, there's many, many success and lots of investment which are good investment here. But how do you, do you create success? Where, how do you bring talent where uh, there's not so much of it? What about uh, smaller communities, the, the crew, the slows, places like that, where there's, that's where the mo there's the most room for, for improvement, there's the most needs, and th you've got good bases to create new communities rather than create brand new cities. So how do you create success in smaller places where, where it's difficult to attract talent Right, and essentially investment. building the critical, ma the critical mass for, for talent. <clears throat> yeah. How do you create success in the, small, in, in the smaller communities? Anyone like to pick that up just for a last question? I mean, a city is, a, by definition, bigger than a, a town, although you could argue about the definition, Gustav. 
Well, we've talked about uh, old cities and new cities, but the big issue is actually renewing the cities all the time. Renewing the cities, bring, uh, making them attractive, uh, having the education, bringing up uh, uh, good educated people to get in businesses. Uh, so, so we have to all the time work with our cities, creating the right framework to make them attractive, to make them possibilities to, for people to, to develop in the cities. So that is more and more becoming important and, and the way you see p uh, cities are marketing themselves towards each other to try to get right. many of the big businesses to come. You see that all the time. And Andrew, last, last comment? Sure, thank you. Um, we really believe that cities are, are doing amazing things right now and I think one of the things that we should be very aware of is Cities around the world, right now, right now, today, are making lots of decisions. And I think there's a lot of money already in cities. There's a lot of energy that's already in cities. And it's the ability of the city to actually understand what it's trying to do. So when you talk about neighborhoods that can be redeveloped or neighborhoods that can be strengthened, the cities can make big changes with that, with the current money that they, curr that they, that they have now. But a lot of times they don't understand what the challenge is that they're trying to face. We want to help cities better understand that. And I think when they understand what they're trying to do, where they're trying to go, and it offers opportunity for them to better leverage their investments that they currently are making to have greater impact on their community. So more of a sharing of best practice in... in sharing of best practices, well. better coordination and vision. Yeah. Great. Well, we have to break there. We have a short networking break. We're actually going to come back for the next session at 10 to 12, not 12. So sorry to cut your networking short, but to move the schedule along. My colleague, Andrew Jack, We'll come and introduce the next session at 10 to 12. Enjoy the networking and please show your appreciation for our excellent panel.